Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Movie, Medicine, Video, and Podcast. Today, we're talking about the Improving Seniors' Timely Access to Care Act, an important piece of bipartisan legislation that would help ease prior authorization challenges that physicians face in caring for their senior patients. Our guest today is Representative Susan Delbeni from Washington State, who's a member of the House Ways and Means Committee, chair of the Moderate New Democrat Coalition, and one of several bipartisan representatives who introduced this important legislation in Congress and is working to get it passed. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Representative Delbeni, Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and for all the work that you've done on behalf of this legislation. Prior authorization has been a huge challenge for physicians and over one third of physician respondents to a recent AMA survey revealed that prior auth led to a serious adverse event for a patient in their care. So let's just start by talking about what prompted you personally to take a leadership role on this issue at the federal level. Well, um, first of all, Todd, thanks for having me. It's great to be here and talk about this incredibly important issue. Um, I don't have the background of a typical member of Congress. I came to the House after a long career working in technology. And um, one of my priorities has been to make sure that our policies have kept up with the way the world works today. And um, I was surprised at how far behind we are in um, using digital technologies as we should and the lack of understanding there. But um, I've also been surprised at the challenges we face, particularly on something like prior authorization, where we are using cumbersome methods, um, fax machines uh, to, uh, to exchange information and, um, and the opportunity that we have not only to update how we use technology to make this process more, more speedy, but to standardize it. Um, you know, I think we all have stories, um, you know, family members, folks we know who have had delays in access to care because they haven't gotten approval in a timely manner. And so um, this is critically important to folks across the country. I know we've heard um, from physicians the challenges um, that are in place and how hard it is to have to use different forms or reply over and over to for little bits of information here and there um, and spend all this time on administration versus caring for patients. So I think our legislation is a straightforward fix that will make a huge difference for patients and for providers. Well, we'll get into details about the legislation in a moment, but broadly speaking, uh, it addresses the way that Medicare Advantage plans use prior authorization and focuses on uh, streamlining and simplifying the processes associated with it. Um, when did you and your fellow bill co-sponsors first realize that this was a problem that really needed to be addressed? Well, about a year before we started working on the bill, we were hearing from providers very regularly about how cumbersome the process has become. Um, this prompted kind of my colleagues, our representative Mike Kelly and um, Dr. Ami Berra to send a letter um, to CMS. Um, we asked them to address this issue. And when CMS politely declined, um, we knew it was time for legislation. Um, it's definitely a bipartisan story because uh, we see this problem. We have a, we, we know that by working together, we can make a difference. And so there's really been a close collaboration to work on legislation and our offices have worked really well together. And frankly, um, the opportunity to do something in a bipartisan way is more rare these days. Um, we have over 290, I think over 300 co-sponsors now, um, which is really unheard of, but it's because of the great collaboration that taken place and just the clarity of the problem that we see um, out there in our communities. So um, I think that gives us the opportunity to, to find a path forward to address this. And it's great to hear that this is a bipartisan effort. Um, can you just give a little bit of background, describe the working relationships that you've developed with uh, other co-leads on this legislation in the House and Senate and how you have been able to work together to address the issue? 
Um, well, our staff meet regularly. We've met regularly because um, we are hearing same stories from our constituents, um, stories from uh, providers throughout the country. And so we've worked together to draft the legislation, to continue to build support with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, to work um, also with our Senate colleagues to build support so that we have uh, not only a strong bill, but also make the case for why the bill needs to move move forward. So it's really been very collaborative um, and between us as members, but also our staff working um, closely together and working with folks on our committees to continue to not only educate folks, but to really build that pathway so we can get the bill across the finish line. And I think, you know, every physician and, and many patients are very familiar with the burdens of this particular process. And we've seen uh, recent, recently some headlines about the consequences uh, of the current way that Medicare Advantage plans operate, uh, and particularly uh, some conclusions that came out of uh, a Health and Human Services Officer of Inspector General report that found that Medicare Advantage plans were inappropriately denying medically necessary care. You talked about some of those stories before. Do you have, you know, paint a picture for us about some of the scenarios you've seen where patients have been negatively impacted by this? Well, um, you know, one great example is uh, um, one of my relatives um, had a uh, had their parent um, was um, was scheduled to have surgery. And this was right after COVID when surgery was finally opening up again. And um, unfortunately, they didn't get authorization in time and had to cancel that surgery, reschedule it for later um, because prior authorization didn't happen in a timely way. So there's one story. There are so many stories that um, we've heard. And if you or your loved one are frustrated by the healthcare system, it's not just you. We know it's folks across the country um, and so many families. And I think the Office of the Inspector General report that you referred to really crystallized what we already knew was happening and the challenges that we faced with prior authorization. So we need to bring it into the 21st century um, and this legislation will do that. Um, you know, we also heard the story about a year ago of a major ins insurer denying prior authorization um, or, or decided they needed prior authorization for every cataract surgery. Um, pretty much a, a, um, a critical common surgery takes place. Um, if you put it off, uh, you're putting your patients in a, in a more difficult scenario too. So um, we also wanted to make sure we had clear practice, established clinical practice guidelines. Um, we know that if things are common, they should, there's less reason they should be delayed. Um, and one of the things we want to make sure we do in the legislation too is gather data. So we know that things aren't delayed for, um, for no reason. Um, we want to make sure that common clinical practice is approved quickly and having that data will really help us to show whether that's happening or not or address ongoing issues. You know, it's interesting hearing you tell that story. We uh, also spoke with our immediate past president, uh, Dr. Harmon, who experienced the same thing with his own mother. It really kind of brings it home. You see it in, in your practice and, and with your family. Um, the foundation of, of this particular legislation is based on principles from a 2018 consensus statement that captured an agreement uh, between health plans and healthcare professionals, including uh, the AMA, on how the prior authorization process could be improved. And there were really five key points. One of them you kind of uh, related just now, which is that selective application of prior authorization and regular review and adjustments, uh, the criteria, greater transparency and communication between physicians and health plans, uh, maintaining continuity of care, of course, and enhancing automation and efficiency, which I don't think includes fax machines. Um, how does this legislation help build on those principles and change the way that Medicare Advantage plans work? Well, I think, you know, really the legislation was broadly built to codify the consensus statement into law. Uh, the bill would establish an electronic prior authorization process, as you said, so we can be 
speedy about getting information um, exchange. It will require HHS to establish a process for real-time decisions for items and services that are routinely approved. Again, um, there's no reason for something that's routinely approved to, uh, to be delayed. Um, improved transparency, we wanted to improve transparency by requiring uh, Medicare Advantage plans to report to CMS on the extent of their use of prior authorization and the rate of approvals or denials. Again, make sure that we have all of that data about what's happening because we don't want, we want to continue to make sure that we are improving the experience for providers and patients, and then encourage plans to adopt prior authorization programs that adhere to evidence-based medical guidelines in consultation with physicians. Um, the, the more that things are standardized, um, the more we can see prior authorization streamlined, the more that um, providers are spending more time providing healthcare versus filling out forms. And uh, in that spirit of standardization, uh, do you think that this legislation could set a precedent for how prior authorization works and potentially have an impact beyond Medicare Advantage plans in the future? In other words, could uh, this help drive similar changes in the private insurance market? I definitely think so. Um, if insurers are investing more in modernizing prior authorization systems, they should be able to leverage that. Um, um, and it definitely helps providers to have it standardized across the board. Um, and we know for, for individuals, it also makes a huge difference to see things move more quickly. So I think if we see strong improvement here, that definitely has an impact um, more broadly. Well, you mentioned up front about the bipartisan support. We talked a little bit, and uh, it's amazing to see uh, how much bipartisan support in the House and the Senate. You mentioned you know, 300 bipartisan House members, 34 senators uh, behind this. You know, do you do you get to see that kind of bipartisan support? Uh, and you know, what's that mean to you when you see numbers like that? Well, yeah, I mean, over 300 co-sponsors is a big deal. Um, I can't think of how many pieces of legislation that we have that um, have such broad support and where you know, we are very ready to make real change here. Um, there is a kind of procedural issue in the House. If a bill reaches 290 co-sponsors, it starts a process that quickly moves the legislation to the floor. Um, in, if, the, if it's not kind of moving through the regular process, um, we probably won't need that because it is, um, we're starting to see movement on our kind of regular order as um, kind of the terminology we would use. Um, I know I serve on the Ways and Means Committee and the Ways and Means Committee is the committee that has jurisdiction over this. And um, the committee is um, moving towards um, marking up the bill next month, um, which is kind of that first position. So hopefully we will see that happen in July. And if we get um, the bill marked up in committee, then it would move to the floor of the House for a vote. Um, we always have, you know, we have the, because we have so many sponsors, um, we always have, a, a, you know, kind of other ways to bring the bills to the floor. But um, I hope that we'll see it go through regular order and through the committee here next month. Um, if we get it through the House, then we can um, hotline it in the Senate, which will, allows it to move more quickly there. Um, so all the hard work that folks have done to build support to describe the challenges that um, that the medical community has faced with this, that patients have faced, um, really has put us in this position, and um, we're starting to see that pay off. Do you foresee any potential roadblocks to uh, moving this forward? Um, I don't see roadblocks right now. We have strong support um, there. I, you know, one of our challenges always is that uh, finding time um, to move legislation because a lot of other things are trying to move at the same time. So, um, but, uh, but because we have so, such strong support for this, um, I think that that gives us a much better advantage. So we're working and you know, hopefully we'll have a, a firm date on when we can see this bill marked up in the Ways and Means Committee. How are the AMA and other healthcare organizations supporting your efforts to get this legislation passed? And why is that kind of support so important? Well, the AMA and physicians have really been key to the success of this legislation. You're the ones out there who have been 
really describing the problem and the impact that it's having on our communities and making and raising that issue with lawmakers, with lawmakers across the country. And that's what's built the strong support that we see for this legislation. In the end, that's what makes the difference and helps us to, um, to move it forward. If physicians or patients would also like to get involved and help support uh, this legislation, what, what could they do? Um, well, one thing they can do um, is, um, you know, continue to share their stories. Um, as they say, you know, we're not done. We're not done yet, and so we need to make sure we keep pushing hard until we have a bill on the president's desk. Um, so share stories. They're so powerful, and they continue to create that sense of urgency that we need. So that I just encourage folks to continue to share those stories, talk to lawmakers if you haven't yet. Um, we have 300 we ha um, co-sponsors. There's 435 members of the House, so we'll continue to add those on until the bill moves. And, um, and then thank folks who have signed on because that has made a difference in getting us um, to where we are today and, and helps us to move forward. I'd also like to invite physicians and patients to visit the site fixpriorauth.org for additional information on the Improving Seniors Timely Access to Care Act and the other ways that the AMA is working to address uh, prior authorization burdens. Uh, Representative Delbeni, thank you so much for being here. That's it for today's episode. Uh, really appreciate that everything that you're doing to support physicians and patients uh, with this work in Congress, uh, whether we're speaking at the AMA National Advocacy Conference in 2019 or to medical students earlier this year, you're always willing to share your time and your perspective on efforts to reform and simplify this incredibly important issue prior authorization. Uh, so thanks again for being here. Uh, that's it. We'll be back soon with another Moving Medicine video and podcast soon. You can find all our episodes at ama-assn.org slash podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Please take care. Thank you.